In this session, we will make a historical overview about computer ethics and the moral issues about computers. Um, the, f the first times where computers were, were, I mean, introduced and widely used for warfare is around World War II. For example, Norbert Wiener, uh, MIT mathematics professor, had worked on an anti-aircraft cannon tracking system. It was a, it was it it was an analog computer, and uh, I mean, it has been used by uh, American air forces in Vietnam and uh, Korea uh, wars. Uh, it was actually making bomb trajectory calculations where they first uh, claimed that the error rate was like uh, 23 meters but then after uh, actual use at war they concluded that uh, it was around uh, like almost 400 meters uh, error rate I mean uh, uh, it's, I think, a huge mistake, but anyway, it has been used widely as a device, and we can say that it was uh, the first uh, uh, applications of computer in warfare, and also the work of Turing for breaking the Enigma code of uh, German in, um, uh, in the World War II, again, it was a crucial moment where computers or, I mean, uh, the analog, those analog machines were about utmost importance during that time. Before that, it was uh, only theoretical work, not even science fiction. Uh, I mean, it was just uh, a mere uh, theoretic work, that's it. The same professor Norbert Wiener, in his uh, 1948 books on uh, book on cybernetics, uh, he wrote this book right after the Second World War, and he underlined that or emphasized that the, those artificial machines can uh, get their input from their sensors. As you see, you see. Look at this. Uh, its input and output need not to be in the form of numbers or diagrams. You see, that's what they providing at the other time. And he said that uh, it. Th 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 he proposed that they could use some artificial sense organs, uh, like the sensors we use now, so that they will get the inputs automatically from real world, which help us to b build the artificial. Uh, machines uh, which uh, uh, which uh, also have artificial intelligence uh, mechanisms. So long before Nagasaki and the public awareness of the atomic bomb, that's from his text, it had occurred to me that we were here in the presence of another social potentiality of unheard importance for good and evil. Look at this. He made this claim in 1948 that the artificial or the computers making decisions can cause problems as well as its benefits in future just like the atomic bomb or atomic uh, atomic um, uh, physics studies so you can uh, in, in fact it was a disaster for humankind i think we should all agree about the atomic bombs and Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So artificial intelligence also has some uh, benefits or uh, let's say artificial machines in future but also there is a potential for evil use as well. That's what he underlines in his study here. Around that time, after uh, the Second World War, there was the, the, the considerations or the discussions about computers were not exactly ethical. They mainly they were mainly grounded on fear 
from the computers or the terrible consequences that can happen in future or degradation of human life in future and those were analyzed in many uh, I mean brilliant uh, scientists and uh, artists and researchers work here like uh, the uh, one of the most famous ones is for example Isaac Asimov's iRobot I strongly suggest you to read this to I mean the, this is the first moment where the three laws of robotics have uh, been discussed in this book uh, actually it has uh, I think maybe 10 uh, short stories in it I strongly suggest you to read it and also the uh, 2001 a space odyssey by Arthur Clarke is a very good one again like uh, it has some uh, again uh, artificial intelligence robots uh, who command the mission to in the space it has been uh, this movie uh, is uh, i mean uh, published in 1968 and it has been directed by stanley kubrick uh, he's a very very famous uh, director like the director and and these were the first times artificial uh, intelligence came into consideration but the things were not exactly ethical the, the 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 things that people discuss it was about the worries about uh, such a future i can also suggest you to watch uh, to see the movie uh, i think it was 1999 matrix by uh, it was again a interesting film about the the fears and terrible consequences of a computer uh, dominated world again you can see that as well if you haven't so far it's very really interesting now the what about the three laws of robotics here as you see these are very famous again again the, the this has been into this has uh, this novel has been uh directed or trans uh, i mean transformed into a movie by hollywood uh a film again with the same name i robot i think will smith was pl was actor he, there but will smith was you can see this as well but it's it's not exactly about the book it's something else but it gives you an idea that's it but the thing is for example as you see uh, here are some three laws here you can read them like a robot may not injure a human being or a robot must obey the orders given it by human as long as it doesn't conflict with the first law and a robot must protect its own existence as well uh, it doesn't conflict with this first and second laws blah blah although they look pretty simple the uh, there are some uh, situations in the book where uh, the uh, machines come into some dilemma about those rules and they, they have been discussed here uh, interestingly and uh, this is again an uh, infamous, uh, I mean, famous uh, dialogue between Dave and Hall. Hall is ex this, uh, like uh, this device, this is the symbol, and uh, Hall was a, a personnel uh, who, who, were, who, who was in that mission and he was trying to get in but the computer doesn't let him in because he thinks that he's dangerous for the job and uh, like you need to see the movie of course i strongly to uh, advise you to see it but the basic idea is uh, i mean again about the contradictions or the dilemmas the computers get into uh, I mean, have in their rules when uh, talking or when uh, encountering uh, situations with the humans. So that's the idea. I strongly suggest you to see this movie as well. 
in the late uh, so this was about the 60s uh, mostly fictional and fears and worries about uh, dark future or dystopia uh, the in the late uh, uh, 1970s there were some uh, remarkable studies uh, for example by uh, Moshowitz the conquest of will information processing and human affairs where lots of data had been prefer, uh, processed by the central uh, computers and they by the government and they are using huge databases for that and again Weizenbaum study about computer power and human reason from judgment to calculation because they were uh, handling lots and lots of data about people again Moore's paper here is pretty interesting. Are there decisions computers should never make? And it has been published in Nature and System in 1979 as well. So it means that these were the first times that ethical issues in the use of computers had began to take stage or uh, so it, it, it became a branch of applied ethics, the computer ethics, for the first time in 1970s. For example, in uh, 1972, ACM's code of ethics had came into consideration and it has some re revisions throughout uh, in, in the next years and I think its last version is dated 2003 or something, I'm not sure, you can check. Uh, so it's more more or less intact I mean the original version there are some slight differences and we should keep in mind that during those times the uh, worries were about the government threat like the, because uh, the large databases were handled by the government and they are doing large-scale calculations for that purpose so in again around the same time uh, in 1976 uh, privacy protection commission has been established in USA as well okay in 1980s uh, i remember those moments myself as well to a degree the networking came into consideration microcomputers were uh, finally available for home computers we're talking about until this time the computers that uh, has been used are I mean I mean they're just uh, huge computers uh, like the size of a room or something that are not suitable for the end users and when they, it, 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 they reduced in size and they be become portable computers here the PCs remote access had been all, uh, also possible and then came the software ethical issues like the intellectual property rights of those software or if there's a fault in software who's to blame who covers the lost and the first time in history computer games had been very very popular and then with the remote access possible then came the problem of hackers and also the business of computing had uh, evolved and proper rights protection and system security issues also came into consideration like computer security ex experts against the hackers for example scientific modeling had been possible and virtual reality took its first steps like you see the uh, ultrasound uh, imaging here and uh, uh, here you see Ward Christensen and the first computer that the uh, ran the first public bulletin board system like the forums it was the communication domain for people during that time and in turkey i guess uh, i had a friend who ran a gecko bbs maybe i remember it long in uh, in turkey too one of my friends and the, the the let's say the dialogue between computer sowies was going on in bulletin board systems during that time then came the 90s 
It is the, it was a time for the rise of democracy, for example, if you consider that internet is a democratic technology. Okay, it's an argument. We will discuss it later. The global property rights came into consideration rather than only property rights. And as we see how the communication between computers evolved here, like the, I mean, milestones. The bulletin board systems were using, uh, and, and many other uh, sites, they were using X25 communication based on that, like the communication protocol in uh, 1981. The idea for ARPANET, the network of networks, th that approach had, ca had came into consideration. And then in 1982, the CCP IP appeared as a merge protocol, like combining many different protocols of that time, in, including this one. And finally, in 1990, the, the idea about World Wide Web, like as you see the maybe the first browser appearance here, uh, it was invented by Tim Berners-Lee, of course, with many other uh, researchers. Uh, in CERN, uh, the H uh, hypertext markup language as well had been introduced here, which makes the core uh, backbone of the internet we use now. Uh, during that time, there was a new discipline here, which is called the uh, cognitive science, like the it was based on the idea of computers, and uh, there was a, a um, again, a study about uh, by Bynum, Ward, and Moore, and it was about it was discussing the digital phoenix, how computers are changing the philosophy as well, because it is changing society. It has effects on the society as well. It has been published in the British Journal of Philosophical Sciences in 1999. And then came the 2000s, like the rise of social media, e-commerce, uh, e-learning and privacy and many other things. Of course, uh, internet games or something you can uh, say. These were all uh, had been possible, which had not been possible before in 2000s, as you know it closely, most probably. And then the 2010s, ubiquitous computing from everywhere, ubicom and Internet of Things was uh, gaining popularity. And the world of mouth is uh, very important. What do people say about your product? And e-integration of uh, like almost all of the uh, services getting integrated with the... Uh, I mean the uh, networking structure and industry 4.0 uh, the uh, devices communicating with each other had been quite popular. Here you can see uh, I took this uh, uh, image from uh, this place. Here you see the social media landscape as of uh, 2019. See Social media is a core structure of society we live in now. It has, I mean, many components, as you see, many mediums for uh, communication. We do here is, though, though, as you see, these are like uh, the networking applications, publishing applications. We share, we publish, we, I mean, uh, connect. And we share uh, what we, uh, I mean, like to people, and we the, uh, we use many uh, uh, applications for messaging and discussions, and also we collaborate for uh, building stuff. You see, there are, I, I, I mean, many types of uh, social media applications that help us with different aspects of, uh, I mean, our needs. These are taken from Ad Holistic, which uh, shows the social media users over time. Here you see in billions here, as you see, it is increasing and increasing dramatically here. Okay, uh, maybe you, you can see that it's slightly slower. Uh, it is increasing at a slightly slower rate than before. 
just because i mean uh, the people who could have access to social media had already i mean had already accessed it uh, that's why uh, we're reaching the i mean almost the people limit on, on earth because i mean okay this is uh, as of 2020 we can maybe talk about say four million people or something how about the uh, remaining uh, three million people for example i mean uh, don't forget the uh, people who are under five years old and like maybe uh, more than i mean older than 70 years old or something there are lots of people uh, around that age and they're unable uh, to use social media uh, because of physical uh, their physical uh, i mean conditions so we can say that social media is truly uh, integrated into our society as of now these are some interesting data from at holistic again i just marked some interesting ones for example i mean it's crazy how many people use facebook like almost two and a half billion people monthly uh, use uh, facebook it's crazy and 96 percent of users use facebook from their mobile devices this is very interesting and there are also lots of platforms who have uh, their users majority of them are female uh, it's possible in our current world i mean when i look back to uh, 1990s or something like this it was uh, I mean, finding female users on the internet, uh, like, uh, or encountering them, like, maybe 100% probability or so, 100, uh, I mean, 1% uh, probability or something. Uh, but uh, today, it's very common that there are some uh, platforms where uh, majority of users are female as well. Instagram uh, had become one of them. As far as I remember, maybe Pinterest can be another platform that has uh, female users as majority as well maybe i'm wrong but you you should check as well these are interesting and about the twitter as you see twitter is an interesting platform again had been frequently used by the politicians as well 85 percent of small and medium enterprises use twitter for product and services promotion you see how I mean, uh, strong uh, pressure or promotion pressure or um, uh, advertisement platform it is. It's, it's pretty, pretty uh, important. And about YouTube, for example, I use it for, uh, I mean, publishing or um, I, help, uh, I use YouTube platform for... Uh, uploading my lectures there so that you can have a access like 62 percent of businesses you use youtube for uh, their companies for promotions and linkedin is uh, i think uh, microsoft owns this company now and uh, like uh, it has uh, 660 million users a lot a lot and uh, like there are uh, uh, 17 million opinion leader and 10 million C-level executives also reside in or also have an account and they are active in LinkedIn as well. It's very, very important in job-wise. Like uh, it's a professional platform for professional social platform for uh, particularly tech, uh, I mean high-tech workers like uh, the uh, or. Uh, computing uh, profession for example there are lots of uh, users or lots of employees from um, computing departments as well here in linkedin and with this mass of social media integrated into our life uh, there is a, a current trend about cyber unhappiness. We, we, we discuss this uh, or we feel this uh, eventually, I guess. Take a moment and think about it. Uh, I mean, this much of interaction with social media uh, can have some diverse effects as well. Not surprisingly, it's about everything. It has some benefits and some 
negative effect. Maybe this can be explained by the paradox of choice and the concept of missed opportunity cost in our lives. It has been underlined by Barry Schwartz's study in 2004. It's very nice. I strongly suggest you to read it. Uh, the name is The Paradox of Choice. Why more is less? It does, uh, he discusses this. I mean, uh, the thing is, suppose that you have like uh, 60 gigabytes of music, uh, like different music uh, load uh, ready in your uh, platform, in your iPad or iPod. I mean, when you're listening to something, it means that you're, you're not listening the remaining 60 gigabytes. It means that you can have very, what if the other ones could be more enjoyable. For example, I can watch any movie I want now, but if I spend my two hours on movie A, for example, movie A, movie A, for example, then it means that I will not be able to see, okay, this much of movies minus uh, one uh, movies I, I cannot watch. So I will be, uh, a bit unpleasant the about the movies that the, uh, I couldn't watch during those two hours. That's the idea about missed opportunity cost because we have same limited amount of time and the more possibilities here, like we're in a digital shopping mall and we're drowning in an information glut, it is resulting in what? Shorter attention span as well. This is also another drawback other than the unhappiness here. It is resulting in cyber unhappiness and it is also having another negative negative effect which is called shorter attention span. Okay, this is maybe not funny anymore, but that's the idea. I mean, our uh, attention spans are getting narrower and narrower. For example, this lecture has been going on for almost 20 minutes now and maybe uh, uh, more than half of the uh, listeners of this lecture or this session is bored already. It's normal. Why? Because, because why? We, we, our attention spans are becoming shorter and shorter. If this video was five minutes long, for example, if I, was, if I were able to teach you or introduce you the same thing in five minutes it would be it would make more sense really it would make more sense but sometimes it's not possible and so attention spans are becoming a problem as well and this is another uh, uh, study by David Loy I suggest you to uh, read it again uh, read it as well. Cyber Babel, he talks about this in uh, where he published this in 2007. Like, uh, you have the answer to your question in a structure like, by, uh, like the libraries of Babel, but uh, you may not be able to find it, and this will really, really cause some uh, dismotivate you. I mean, uh, demotivate you. Uh, in the sense, suppose that uh, you want to learn about logic design, for example, digital logic design, but how, where can I start studying having so many options and uh, maybe there is a best book or best source for that, but am, will I be able to find it directly or what if I, the source I find uh, I am already studying is uh, not efficient enough, how could I know, whatever, these are all uh, resulting in some worries. So th this is maybe, I'm just making a prediction here by 2040, are we gonna end up like the cyber babel uh, proposed or discussed by David Loy? We will see. And again, this one is an interesting advertisement that you should uh, see. I think uh, Anna Pakuin is playing here in this advertisement. Uh, you, I suggest you to watch it on YouTube as well, where this advertisement mentions that there will not, there will be no there with the networking. I mean, we're all we're always connected with everything. 
So the, the idea of going from here to there is no more. We're already there for everything. So this is again a demotivating factor because maybe I'm just, I'm just uh, arguing that because it's related with David Lloyd's paper as well. It's the journey that makes, the, makes it interesting. The journey that going from here to there is what makes us human. Maybe I'm just discussing here and I leave the discussion to you uh, reading about it uh, on your own as well. And how about 2060? Our, uh, I mean, uh, we, we have a human dystopia that has been discussed in Wally, -E, for example. If you haven't watched yet, I strongly suggest you to watch this movie as well. It's a very, very good one. So in by 2060, are we gonna face a human dystopia like it's been discussed in uh, uh, Wally, -E, this particular movie? Are we gonna wake into a world dominated by uh, the uh, robots and artificial intelligence uh, applications in all domains of our life? Are we going to have a future like this? Just think about it. But if we go back today, there are two uh, main concerns of, this is my opinion, today's world. One of them is the global warming threat, okay, and these are the, and the other one is, you can read a lot about it in, uh, on the internet and you can watch some uh, documentaries about it. This is a serious problem that we shouldn't overlook. And the slaughter bots is another concern. I want you to watch this on uh, just uh, this is the slaughter bots. Slaughter bots. Please watch this on look for this on YouTube and it's very interesting. And there is a comment about Norway, uh, Russell Norwig, uh, uh, Stuart Russell. I'm sorry, I, I told you. Stuart Russell, Professor Russell. Uh, at the end of the, uh, at the end of the, uh, I mean, uh, that movie, a uh, short movie, uh, which is pretty interesting. We shouldn't let uh, the devices or artificial intelligence make the decisions about who gets killed. So uh, it's also, I think, another concern of Today also there's another reality, the e-learning. I mean, look what people is discussing uh, lately. Do developers need to have college degrees at all? Most, I mean, because why? It, uh, the if you want to be a developer in future, I think most of you uh, want that. Uh, I mean, you see that the majority of developers are self-taught they learn by themselves and they also learn on the job when they get a job on the job i mean hands-on training uh, hands-on learning and then comes the education traditional uh, university education or college education then the online courses and if you're planning a master's degree for example it's like uh, the effect in the, the developer scene is like, and the PhD is very little, you see. Uh, so then people started discussing, uh, is it, I mean, the, the, the driving factor should be college degrees or not? I mean, if someone gets the work done uh, very well by, uh, I, I mean, uh, by his expertise or something, People may not care whether they have degrees or not. This is how the education is evolving. And today, there is some pressure from uh, pandemic as well. We, I mean, eventually had been forced into e-learning. Uh, of course, this is not uh, directly e-learning, but that's the idea. You, you, you learn by yourself. This is what uh, pandemic has driven us into. Uh, I mean... Uh, eventually we're doing this today so we discussed all of this as ice breaking okay as you see we just made an ice breaking about the this lecture 
the topics or the um, arguments we will discuss throughout this lecture will evolve or will turn around those arguments that we discussed uh, uh, in this session as well they, they, they they're they're more like about this and if we go ahead and make some definitions Let's look, look at the morals and morality. Morals correspond to one's personal beliefs about right or wrong. What is right or wrong? And morality is coming from the Latin moralitas, which corresponds to its meaning in Latin as manner, character, or proper behavior. How do we behave? And it has three principal meanings at all. In its first descriptive or practical or real usage morality means a code of conduct held to be authoritative in matters of right and wrong why morals are created by and define society philosophy religion or individual conscience now um, because uh, it's it is uh, it is an obligation or it's a driving force from the society we live in but more importantly, in its second and normative and universal sense, morality refers to an ideal code of conduct for one which could be exposed in preference to alternatives by all rational people under specified conditions. Okay, you will have many alternatives for doing one thing okay like uh, like uh, I should do that, should do that or a, I, sh I can take the turn a turn b or turn c but i would uh, which one i I, sh uh, I would choose should follow an ideal code of conduct here that's the idea which which uh, is based on some universal norms and finally it's in its third usage the practical one that we will refer to morality is synonymous with the same meaning with ethics what is ethics the systematic philosophical study of the moral domain this is what we're trying to do and ethics is a major branch of philosophy encompassing right conduct right conduct and good life it is significantly broader than the common conception of analyzing right and wrong yes we will discuss what is right or wrong but we will see in virtue ethics as well sometimes we go above that okay a central aspect of ethics is the good life the the life worth living or a life that is simply not only satisfying if we uh, i mean uh, we should go look for more than that of course we want to i mean be happy we, we need to satisfy ourselves but that could not be our ultimate goal the ultimate goal should be the good life, the life worth living. Otherwise, it could be, if we only focus on pleasures, maybe it could be called hedonism, right? Hedonism. But uh, the uh, ethics is uh, dealing with something more than that, okay? A life worth living, which is held by many philosophers, agree on this, to be more important than moral conduct. Not only, you see... We don't focus only on moral conduct, what is right or wrong, but we also focus, which is more important, a life worth living. And ethics describes this a standard, uh, the standard codes of behavior expected of an individual or by a group, like a nation or organization or a profession, like for example, computing profession, to which an individual belongs, okay? A, a computing profession should behave like this in these particular scenarios, for example. We will discuss this throughout the lecture, don't worry. And let's make a distinction or let's make let's underline the relationship between the laws and moral acts. Lo let's make the definitions here. Laws are a system of rules that tells us what we can and we cannot do. Okay. Laws are enforced by a set of institutions. That should be some enforcement here, whether the police, courts, or lawmaking bodies. Uh, and legal acts are acts that conform to the law, which are suitable with the law. 
So this is about the laws. Of course, we expect our laws to be moral, but that we will see later that something uh, which is which is confirming the law can be immoral and something immoral can be aligned with the law. We, we will see that. And moral acts conform to what an individual believes to be the right thing to do in a particular situation. Laws can proclaim act and is legal, although many people may consider the act as immoral. This is possible. We will look at this dilemma or this uh, problem or this uh, phenomenon later in the next sections. If you want to discuss about, for example, abortion, these are just some examples, euthanasia, for example, I mean, it would be quite hard for us uh, to reach a conclusion or uh, uh, like to reach a consensus just by discussing, for example, about 15 minutes, uh, considering about the laws we have and the moral uh, acts that uh, or universal use uh, uh, rules that we should take into consideration, and we will discuss such issues. And not, uh, maybe it's uh, not surprising that many issues in uh, real life are. Uh, very very complicated uh, as well so so in this session we discussed about the history of computer addicts and uh, the computer related issues and it was just a ice breaking session uh, that could be interesting for you uh, or helpful throughout the lecture in the next sessions.